hi, my name's Anna Saren. I'm Director of Listings Development with the Canadian Securities Exchange. I'm joined here on this 1st of May, 2020 with Richard Carlton, our CEO and fearless leader at the Canadian Securities Exchange, and Bruce Campbell, who is a Portfolio Manager with Stonecastle Funds. Thank you both for joining me today. Thanks for having Thanks, us. Anna. <laughs> uh, so first of May, I will preface our conversation. We are we are going to focus our conversation on the cannabis sector today, but we'll preface that we are having this conversation May first, twenty twenty. We've all been you know under the influence of the global pandemic, COVID nineteen. Um, I think now officially we are six to seven weeks in. Um, you know, eight weeks in. Wow. And, and, you know, it's been really interesting uh, and we'll get into a bunch around the cannabis sector, but the cannabis sector has had some interesting movements based on what's happening in the global economy. And we'll, we'll jump into that. Um, you know, uh, Bruce, I'm, I'm so thrilled that, that you're joining us. And before we jump into what you do and why you're here with us today, Richard, I thought it'd be a good idea to kind of um, give a lead into why the CSC became such a leader in the cannabis space. Do you mind going back in time and, and retelling our story a little bit there? Sure, Anna. Um, it's about a six-year story at this point, uh, amazingly yeah. enough. It, <laughs> it, time, time has indeed flown, but um, it was, uh, I think, in about February 2014 uh, when uh, Mark Faulkner, who's, uh, as you know, our VP of uh, List Company Regulation, um, came in to uh, have a chat with me, and uh, he was asking me about these uh, cannabis issuers uh, from Canada, uh, who had applied under the uh, MMPR uh, regime uh, to become uh, cultivators of, uh, of uh, medical cannabis. Um, the regime had basically been created by uh, or in response to the federal government losing about its 14th uh, court case in a row uh, on access to uh, uh, medical marijuana products. And um, um, the, we had a couple of companies that had approached us um, with a view to listing on the exchange, um, they had been uh, effectively turned away uh, by the exchange, uh, which uh, at that point was located around the corner and across the street from us uh, in uh, Toronto. And uh, we uh, uh, really, really worked this hard for about five minutes, I think, uh, and concluded that uh, these companies were perfectly appropriate vehicles uh, uh, for the public markets. And uh, uh, there was uh, considerable regulatory support. Um, you know, again, there, there were going to be some disclosure issues involved, obviously. But they were entering into a legal business, were capable of providing all of the reps and warranties that we expect of any uh, listed issuer in Canada. And uh, so the first two companies which came across the, uh, uh, the transom were uh, uh, Aurora and uh, Supreme Pharmaceuticals. And uh, as those companies listed, and uh, of course, uh, there was an immediate interest from the retail and uh, specialty investment space in Canada, the United States, and elsewhere, um, we quickly developed a cohort that uh, uh, grew to, uh, think, about 20 companies by the end of June uh, in that year. So, uh, and, and of course, again, there was tremendous popularity in the retail investment community in particular. Uh, in uh, in these names that uh, were you know amongst the uh, early and prominent uh, uh, applicants uh, for cultivation licenses in Canada. And I mean, obviously, it grew from there. And then, and and the U.S. side of things was was kind of another big factor, uh, you know, for the growth within the exchange. Um, you know, yeah, and that was uh, that was a couple of years, Anna. And um, you know, as I always said, we we had to think about that one a lot harder. Uh, for obvious reasons. Um, the uh, inclusion of cannabis uh, in Schedule One of the Controlled Substances Act in the United States uh, is uh, something we had to consider very carefully uh, when accepting a representation and warranty from the company that uh, they were operating their business in accordance with applicable law. But uh, uh, when we looked at the situation, we, we saw that the SEC at that point had already uh, given receipts for prospectuses for companies that touch the cannabis plant in the United States. They were operating in states that had um, significant and very complicated regulatory regimes uh, for these uh, companies uh, to meet. And uh, there was already uh, a well-established practice of disclosure 
uh, for companies operating in the cannabis uh, space that we developed in Canada that was obviously applicable to the United States as well. So after a good deal of soul ser searching, we uh, agreed that uh, companies operating in the United States uh, were eligible to list on the exchange as well. And, you know, that clearly um, put us up a few weight classes, uh, if I can say that. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> but uh, um, you know, having been in isolation for eight weeks, I'm I'm going to need another six, I think, to go on a starvation diet before we go back to the office. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, in any event, um, the, these companies obviously were considerably larger uh, in in many cases than their Canadian uh, peers, and um, again had uh, significant retail and beginnings of institutional investor interest. And uh, from a CSE perspective, it obviously. Uh, was a tremendous enhancement to our business because it certainly put us uh, uh, on the front burner of a lot of places that uh, uh, we wouldn't have gotten to otherwise. Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, I wish I had the exact numbers to date on me, but I believe the last time I looked, we had about 170 issuers that were focused in the cannabis space. Uh, 60 to 70 of those, I believe, have operations in the U.S., um, and over the past 12 months, it's just billions and billions in capital that was raised, um, you know, and, and obviously even more so in, um, in market capitalization. Um, Bruce, this is where I'm going to jump in with you a little bit because I, I, I wanted Richard to start the story from the beginning for a very specific reason is you were one of the front runners, um, you know, as a portfolio manager with Stonecastle to create a cannabis fund. And I'm sure when you started this, uh, it wasn't an easy task. There's a lot of, uh, it wasn't necessarily just your pick of, of public companies or, or well-established private companies. It's very much, you know, kind of in the grassroots stage, um, you know, as well as kind of making the assessment of what would be appropriate for your portfolio mandate. So why don't you tell us a little bit about Stonecastle and, you know, kind of the creation of this fund? Yeah, as you said, it's something that wasn't easy and has been kind of long in the works for sure. And if you, you know, you kind of go back in the history of, you know, Richard talked a little bit about the, uh, about, about your experience in the sector, you know, I'll talk a little bit about ours in that, you know, when we originally looked at this, when the government made those changes uh, from the MMAR to MMPR, we took a look and said, oh, wow, this is, uh, this is quite the opportunity here that, you know, probably we won't see again in a lifetime. And we started to uh, slowly invest in the sector. And we, we did so quite quietly, actually, to start with for, for a couple of reasons. First off is, uh, you know, it was, it was kind of new, a new environment and was still, you know, for the most part, I would say kind of frowned upon by the masses. And the second was, is, you know, being a, a independent investment firm based in uh, the Okanagan of BC, which is really a hotbed for black market cannabis. We really didn't want to be tarred with the brush that we were, you know, some type of stoner portfolio managers. So while we saw this tremendous opportunity to make money for clients, we also we're trying to balance it with the reputational risk. And so that went on for, uh, for quite some time. And then one day I had um, an interview with, with one of the Bloomberg reporters who quite often will phone me and just sort of, you know, chit chat about what's moving on the markets for that day. And, and so we were talking back and forth and I said, no, have you seen these cannabis stocks? Cause this is, you know, this is probably 2000 and uh, you know, late 2014 or early 2015. And he said, no, I, I don't even follow them. And so I sort of brought his attention to him and he quoted me and, and then, you know, we started getting a lot of inbound calls and, and information. We we're looking for information on, you know, different companies and how we were investing. And at that point in time, I thought, well, there's got to be a real need here. And, you know, there's probably a sector that people want to invest in. How do we do this? And so at that point in time, I was working with a couple of different fund companies and we, you know, started kind of exploring it and looking down that path. And, and they basically, you know, said, no, we don't, we don't want to do this just, you know, purely from two standpoints. One is, I don't know if we'll be able to raise enough money because these companies are so small and they haven't really raised much money. And then two was, uh, you know, from a reputational risk, like we don't want to be, you know, getting into something that's illegal. And I, you know, explained to them like, no, it's, it's not, it's like, you know, it's, it's federally legal right now from a medical standpoint, and depending on what happens with the election, it might be even recreationally legal. And so, you know, it was kind of put on the back burner, obviously, you know, a lot changed in history. We got, you know, the election happened in the, Trudeau government came in, they legalized, um, they legalized it. And then, you know, there was obviously more interest. Uh, we started working through the process. It was a lot of back and forth with, uh, with the securities regulators, you know, making sure that we were, 
again, almost like what you said, Richard, you know, dealing with companies that were, that were legal and that they were operating in a legal um, framework and legal jurisdictions. And, and once we sort of got through all that, we were able to get the fund, you know, up and running and, and, you know, now here's where we're at. And, you know, obviously there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of investors who, you know, look at the opportunity here and look at the potential for this to be, you know, huge growth opportunity over the next decade, both in Canada and globally. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I, I'm thankful for both of you because you guys were both at, at the front end of, of this, you know, going back to 2016, I'd say 15, people were putting just in their press release that they were looking at the sector. And, and so there was, unfortunately, there was some not nice things that were happening kind of in the sector. And, and I think a lot of our, um, you know, network's view on it was that everything was a scam, but there really was this unbelievable opportunity, probably the only one I'll see kind of in in my career in the capital markets where we saw it come to the markets from day one and and where it's gone gone from there um, you know I'm sure it'll be all part of our retirement funds by the time this is all said and done and and part of some of the you know major senior companies so it's been a pleasure to be a part of the the beginning stages of it um, I you know I as you're as you're speaking Bruce I just I have to chuckle a little bit at how times have changed the last time we sat together um, Richard, your blessed soul, you got on an Air Canada Rouge flight direct from Toronto to Kelowna, and I flew out from Vancouver, and we all got to sit together in the Okanagan. So I definitely miss those days and looking forward to the next time we can do this in person again. Um, you know, uh, from just, I, I don't know how much you can tell us about Stone Castle and the fund itself, but I, I know we've chatted about it in the past. You do have some uh, private and public elements to it. Can you tell us a little bit about the formation of it? Yeah, so there's, we really manage uh, two different uh, cannabis investment portfolios. So we've got our own fund, which is called the Stonecastle Cannabis Growth Fund. And we, uh, we partner with Spartan Investments out of Toronto with that one. And then we also manage uh, the, we manage the public portion of the Cannabis Growth Opportunity Corporation, which trades actually on the CSE. And we did an IPO back in 2018 to, uh, to list that company. And it's really, you know, kind of a hybrid investment company that invests in, you know, both private and public companies. We're, we're able to invest in some private companies with the, uh, with the Stonecastle Cannabis Growth Fund as well. Uh, we have to balance that obviously with our, our requirements from the regulators on uh, illiquid positions, but we do. And, uh, and then, you know, obviously, as far as the, the gamut of public investing, you know, we really look, you know, kind of everywhere and, and anywhere for opportunities. So, you know, be that, you know, Canada, US or internationally. And, you know, we've over the years, we've kind of morphed, we've had, you know, where at one point in time, we only held LPs to now, you know, we've got, you know, kind of everything from, you know, LPs to service providers to, you know, extractors to, you know, brand companies, and, uh, you know, kind of everything in between. Well, you know, one day you guys should partner up at the end of this and, and write a book together because you both have amazing stories of <laughs> you know, early stage due diligence. Um, Some spot. colorful, interesting stories. Colorful. Yeah. That's, for, that's for like our late night version of this. Uh, of <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So one Speaking thing I of which, I, I, am doing, I am doing a podcast tonight uh, at uh, 10 o'clock uh, with our friends from the Happy Monkey in New York City. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. <laughs> so, so, so that ought to be, uh, yeah, that that will definitely be uh, not safe for work and uh, and uh, not not uh, family rated. I'm guessing. <laughs> Late night with Richard Carlton. Um, okay, one thing I'd love to talk about because I think one thing we're obviously as investors. Um, we're very much in the now. We're very much in what we think is going to happen tomorrow. Let's talk about yesterday. Let's talk about, and I'd love both of your feedback on this. What was the state of the cannabis sector before the, let's call it a global shutdown due to the pandemic, which was around early March. So, um, you know, maybe um, Richard, I don't know if you want to start there. What, what did you see as a status of the sector before this? Well, I think we were seeing our first big shakeout. Uh, both in Canada and the United States. Um, you had uh, emerging winners and losers on both sides of the border. Um, and I think uh, talking to lots of folks, the general consensus was that given the ability to uh, market, uh, have a full range of products, like really from day one, 
uh, with recreational legalization in the United States. And especially, of course, given the population of the states involved and the prospects for you know, New York, uh, Connecticut, uh, New Jersey coming online relatively soon was the, was the view. Uh, was that uh, the United States was presenting perhaps the better prospects uh, in, the, in the immediate future. And even though the obviously valuations were down substantially, uh, you know, people throw around the 90% number, um, you know, and, which doesn't mean that all companies were off at that level, but uh, you know, there clearly been a considerable sell off in the space. Uh, we were beginning to see US private companies in particular and a few Canadian companies as well who'd been private for longer, uh, who had been bootstrapping uh, their um, uh, investments uh, to, to get to the level uh, where they were going to be public. And so we were beginning to have a lot of conversations with folks who kind of put that public or going public transaction uh, on the shelf for a year or two. And we were thinking that uh, 2020 was going to be quite a robust year for us uh, in terms of uh, new uh, US companies, which would be coming to market, which were not startups, uh, who already had considerable levels of sales presence uh, in a variety of markets. And as uh, Bruce says, maybe not necessarily just conventional seed to sale folks, but people with extraction technologies or specific product uh, design capabilities or branding um, that's been that's already proven itself in the consumer marketplace. Um, obviously, we've <laughs> had a bit of a setback uh, on, on that. Um, the other factor, actually, I should say, too, is, of course, we had a number of companies that uh, were running out of cash um, and we're going to have to either restructure uh, or, in some cases, um, look at some kind of reorganization, um, whether it was bankruptcy, although again, the US guys uh, can't uh, uh, use US bankruptcy laws uh, because of the illegality at the federal level. Um, so council and advisors to the companies were looking at a variety of ways uh, with their creditors uh, for these companies to successfully reorganize to ensure that the assets that they had developed um, you know, can carried on in, in, in some way, shape or form, either with the company or some successor. Bruce, any further comment to that? I mean, obviously the biggest thing kind of before this was, was along Richard's points, we started to actually see, you know, kind of as we were coming through that, the emergence of some companies that were already starting to, you know, see some acceleration from what they had done in the past. And the companies that were re really decelerating and, you know, who had potentially raised money in the past and probably didn't invest it or put it to work quite as well as they should have and, and were really feeling the effects. But we, are, we were seeing, you know, some of that acceleration as well. Yeah, I mean, that's a very polite way of saying that there were certain companies that probably shouldn't have had as much access to capital as they did. <laughs> My favorite line, Anna, uh, from one of the analysts was... Uh, Yes, we've discovered which companies were holding cash barbecues. <laughs> yeah. I, think if you, I think if you actually went back in history, there's, there's probably not too many companies in the entire sector that, you know, would, if, if, if they knew what they know now, would probably have managed the capital the way they did. Um, right. But, you know, obviously that's hindsight, right? Well, and Richard, you brought up once you had you had been speaking with um, with a brokerage firm in um, Canada that had done some real analysis on. Uh, I think it was mainly Canadian companies. Do you remember what we were talking about there? It was an analysis on the actual Canadian companies in the sector that had actual revenues. I think it was one of the one of the independents was talking about that. Yeah, well, I think the uh, particular focus of that study was um, who had sufficient cash uh, to get them to uh, some kind of either cash flow or EBITDA positivity. And, uh, you know, the reality is that it was quite a short list and that uh, many names, familiar names uh, in the industry, were going to have to either considerably cut down uh, their overhead uh, and find new sources of capital or some combination of the two. And so, you know, again, that, um, uh, you know, I think was, was a, 
a, a real wake up call for a lot of investors in the space, uh, understanding in fact, uh, you know, how, how much capital was being, uh, uh, had, had, had been used up basically in the space. And, well, and, and since that report, we've actually seen, uh, you know, we've seen a couple, a bunch of companies that were on that list who have cut back uh, headcount and then also done, you know, fairly, uh, fairly down, you know, significant down rounds of financing. To, in order yeah, to and, uh, and, and debt at, uh, you know, very, very, very hard terms. Yeah. Uh, and, and of course, as we know, um, I forget what uh, John Fowler decided to call the softball team made up of the, uh, uh, the, the founders of the original LPs. But, but as we know, they're pretty, all pretty much moved on at this point. So, yeah. Hey, um, just for people listening, because this comes up a lot, and Richard, we've had this discussion a lot, just for our listeners. Can, um, Bruce, why don't you define for us what a down round is? So if you, if you raise money at, uh, you know, say a dollar per share, and then the next time you raise money, it's uh, 25 cents per share, that, that would be considered a down round because it's lower than the last level that you raised it. And in some cases, we've even seen, you know, where, uh, where they did that, but, you know, say their stock was trading at, uh, you know, 50 cents and they did the, they did the round, they halted the stock and they did the round at uh, 25 cents. So you've, you've seen uh, some fairly significant uh, reductions in share price. Yeah. And that's a really tough one. Uh, you know, there's only one situation where that might not uh, mean terrible things for, for their future is that, you know, the shareholders are such a tight knit group. They've come together and decided to, you know, readjust their adjusted cost base and keep the company going because they really see the value in it. But otherwise it's typically not a great sign. So uh, one thing I did want to point out um, is, you know, one thing people do need to also remember is this sector, like any other in the small cap space, especially, it really brought another um, generation to, to investing the retail market. And I think a lot of some of the oddball stuff that we saw was because we had a, we had a large group of unsophisticated retail investors that came to the market. Um, some of the valuations of the Canadian companies and some U.S. Um, probably didn't deserve the valuations they had, but people just kept supporting the, the share prices, kept supporting um, their initiative and kept writing checks, you know, uh, for their treasuries and their financings. Um, you know, I was looking forward a little bit not not to be too uh, cruel to our issuers but I was looking forward a little bit to the shakeout only because I think there was a lot of family offices and institutions that were ready on the sidelines they were ready to kind of start jumping in feet first um, and they were waiting for that shakeout to happen to come in at the right time and then of course this all happened so um, maybe you could both comment on how the cannabis sector has been affected by this global shutdown Go ahead, Bruce. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's a little bit like a golf course, right? The, the first owners typically aren't the ones that make money. Um, <laughs> it, it seems like this sector is a little bit like that in that, you know, the first owners of the stock aren't necessarily the ones that make money. And that in, in some cases now, that even includes the, uh, the founders. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, the, you know, the shakeout's been, been pretty severe. Uh, but what, you know, what we are seeing now is that, again, like we're seeing that bifurcation and you're seeing some some businesses that are that are very strong and that you know if they have access to capital or if they manage the capital correctly are going to do phenomenally well here and so you know we we think that while it's been an extremely painful correction for a lot of the people who are new to investing um, there's still potential opportunity for them to make you know significant amounts of money going forward does it happen in the same time frame that it was in you know, say January of 2018 and, and, you know, where you could have a double or triple in, in a number of weeks, probably not, but you know, there'll be real businesses that are built out of this that'll end up being leaders in the space, both in Canada and the U S and, and probably globally. Um, and if you can, you know, find them and invest in them, you can make a great return going forward. So, you know, it's kind of not all lost on those people who, you know, maybe invested in something that, was a little bit higher than they probably should have paid. And also, you know, even if you have capital that you want to rotate, you know, if you sort of got hooked into sort of the hot stock or the great idea that, you know, hasn't panned out because either they weren't able to execute or, you know, just really didn't exist. There, there are other alternatives that, you know, can generate great return. 
Absolutely. And Richard, uh, maybe you can comment on this a little bit. One thing that was uh, nobody expected, I mean, it all happened so fast, is um, cannabis was deemed an essential service, which definitely, um, you know, changed things for some of our issuers. You want to talk about that a little bit? Well, it was a, it was a bit of a, a mixed bag, actually. Um, you may recall that uh, in Ontario, it, orig- it was, then it wasn't, and then it was again, except they would allow for curbside and uh, delivery, for example. Wasn't curbside um, the original uh, <laughs> delivery system? <laughs> <laughs> it was only buying 7-Eleven. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, um, and, and although you're right, the, the posture in most of the states where it's legal recreationally, with the prominent exception of uh, Massachusetts, um, it has been deemed an essential service. And in fact, I think uh, somewhat humorously, there are some states where you can't buy booze, but you can buy weed. Um, so it, there's no doubt that, uh, you know, some of the numbers coming out of the industry uh, watchdogs are spectacular in terms of sales increases uh, since uh, the locked or- down orders uh, went into place. I've seen some jurisdictions with increases like in the 600% range. So, um, but, I, but I think, again, what this speaks to is, um, and, and, and again, I mean, we haven't really talked about this, but fundamentally, we know that there is a considerable business here, right? I mean, if you leave, strip everything else away, we know there is a tremendous consumer demand uh, for cannabis, both as a medical and a recreational product. And, you know, the issue here is like way back uh, in the, 20s and 30s as uh, prohibition was ending, uh, where we knew people had a taste for wine, liquor, and beer, um, there will be a consumer packaged goods industry of considerable size in North America uh, as uh, we, we get through all of the stigmas and the supply chains work their way through and we get some of the governments uh, um, a little bit more comfortable with people actually uh, engaging in sales and marketing activity and brand development and all of the things that you would accept uh, or expect in a consumer packaged goods uh, uh, business uh, to take place in the cannabis space. And as Bruce says, you know, we know, like we know that there will be significant industry leaders in the space um, there, some of them are probably with us now. They're probably not all invented yet. And, uh, you know, there will be considerable uh, investment opportunities uh, with these companies that are going to succeed and uh, address that consumer demand. I think that's a really good point. And I, I think one thing, you know, from a social level that this might implement is, um, uh, you know, there was one of our issuers came out, uh, you know, with the tagline, the new normal, which is funny because I hear the new normal a lot under this pandemic. Um, and um, I wonder if people realize that it came from MedMen and Spike Jones. But, um, you know, I think the one thing that it really has implemented in our infrastructure as a society is that, one, I bet you there's a lot of people who are dealing with anxiety issues or sleep issues. Um, and this has now become, uh, honestly, a new normal under this pandemic. I think it might have been, you know, the nail in the coffin in, in certain parts of the world as far as what this product is in our life um, as well as you know people are probably now at home with family members and so it, it might have removed some of the stigma of the use of it um, and and you know its value uh, the properties of its value um, one thing I am curious about because because uh, the next conversation I want to have with both of you is kind of the next, the financing side and the capital market side. But is there any um, part of the sector from based on where we're at now within the pandemic um, and the social distancing world that we live in, do you think there's any part of the sector that might have some, um, you know, headwinds over another part? Bruce, any thoughts there? Uh, You know, probably not. uh, Initially, there would have been a lot. Like, I mean, you know, as an example, there was, you know, certain states that had big headwinds, you know, like in Nevada, as an example, where they went from, you know, where a lot of it was, was uh, tourist driven, and, you know, it was all going into stores to where they, you know, went to curbside and delivery. Um, You know, so that was obviously a headwind that these businesses have had to adapt to. But that's one of the things about the cannabis sector is that, you know, they have grown up in this industry so fast that 
adoption has been and, and change has been something that they've had to embrace. If they didn't, they were probably out of business. So, you know, there's, there's certain elements that would have headwinds, but you know, for the most part, most of these companies are pretty entrepreneurial and move fast. They're not big, slow companies that, you know, take forever to make a decision because if they did, they'd be out of business. So, you know, this is just going to enhance that one more notch, which management teams have the ability to, you know, move on their feet quickly and who don't. And, and so you're, you know, probably going to see that over the next couple of months with or without, you know, a lockdown. Yeah. Uh, one thing is, and, and I know, you know, Richard, maybe you want to touch on this because I know you've done so much international travel over the past few years is how do you think this is affecting, um, you know, within the capital market space, how do you think this is affecting the cannabis side sector um, from an international level? I mean, obviously, we're fairly close to what's going on in Canada and the US, but any thoughts on how this is affecting us on a global scale within the capital markets? Well, understand that the international story is largely a medical one. Uh, surprisingly enough, um, in continental Europe, for example, uh, there really isn't much of a constituency for legalized recreational uh, cannabis. Um, and most of the companies that are looking to address the market opportunity uh, in the European Union, for example, uh, are doing so through uh, either nutraceuticals or pharmaceuticals. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a different take. Um, and, uh, you know, in many respects, people have to talk about wellness um, or cannabis or, or specific formulations uh, being responsive to an ailment that you've got, pain, inflammation, uh, sleep issues, uh, anxiety, as you say. And, uh, you know, that's a different uh, uh, thing than building a recreational brand because uh, you have to go through clinical trials and uh, the EU has a mountain of regulations and then you have to meet the regulations in the individual countries and so on. So, you know, again, suffice to say, that's a, a longer, slower build. Now, that said, there is considerable enthusiasm for the products uh, in Europe and Asia and various other markets. Um, but as I say, it's not going to be the big explosion in activity that you got in North America uh, from the re legalization of, of, uh, of, of recreational cannabis. What you will probably see is uh, uh, Australia uh, will, will probably join in uh, the recreational cannabis uh, uh, movement at some point. Um, in fact, in many respects, you, <laughs> it'll be the Anglosphere. Uh, and I don't know what it is about speaking the English language and cannabis, but, um, you know, if, uh, you know, it, will likely be, uh, the UK certainly will have the most uh, liberal uh, of the regimes uh, in place in Europe. And uh, again, as mentioned, uh, Australia and possibly New Zealand, uh, I think will be coming along as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, Richard, I don't think I've ever asked you this and maybe I should know this, but what is, um, what is the take on other exchanges across the globe? Are, are there cannabis companies on other exchanges worldwide? Only where um, it's legal in the country where the exchange is located. Okay. And so uh, you do see um, a small handful of companies that are uh, active in, the, uh, in doing CBD related products uh, in the UK. Uh, so the AIM, uh, I believe has uh, uh, one or two companies. Next has one. Um, Ooh, there are a couple of other uh, exchanges in Europe uh, that have got them. But again, there are companies that are operating in that local jurisdiction um, within whatever framework exists uh, for, as I say, typically a medical uh, or um, nutraceutical product. So Australia, Australia has some listings too, I think, don't they? That's right. Yeah. And so interestingly enough, Bruce, you know, they, they have the same issues, of course, as the early pioneers in Canada do in that Australian institutions and a number of investment uh, advisors won't touch it, uh, even though they are legal uh, in the uh, Australian context. So um, won't surprise you to learn that uh, at some point in the not too distant future, I suspect that we'll see our first uh, handful of listings uh, from the Australian market as well. Well, I think that's, uh, you know, the, the nice side of that is that the sector probably has still some major global upside and, and probably still some, lots of work for all of us to do, that's for sure, within the sector. Um, bringing it back home for a second, Bruce, 
you know, one thing that happened, um, you know, briefly before this all started was the legalization of edibles in Canada. Um, can you maybe speak to how that has changed in any way? Is there a lot of investor money that's going towards it? Is there a lot of companies popping up? What, what does that side of the sector look like? You know, in Canada, we haven't seen a lot of, you know, say completely upstart companies in the 2.0 environment what we've seen is that you know a lot of the existing companies were already positioning themselves for that in some cases you have lps that were almost exclusively positioning themselves in the last couple of years for that as they um you know work towards you know doing joint venture deals with with other brands uh who had existing products or or um you know just putting in the pieces and you had some companies that have come in you know sort of on the picks and shovel side of things who will support that business, you know, either providing a product or a service that allows, you know, an LP or, you know, any type of, uh, any type of company that's sort of chasing the branded 2.0 opportunity to be able to deliver. And we've seen that, you know, really in, in Canada, we've seen, you know, there's a number of opportunities there where they've, um, you know, where they've really leveled on or layered on, you know, different levels of, of, uh, services in order to provide and sort of be that one-stop shop. So, you know, extraction services and beverage, you know, and encapsulation technology and, you know, that type of thing. Well, and I guess there was, um, you know, with the anticipation that we knew that the edibles would be coming down the pipeline, I, I think what you're saying is a lot of companies were preparing for that. So it's not necessarily out of the gate on October 17th. It was a bunch of, you know, uh, new entrepreneurs out there, but more so companies that were getting ready for that moment. Yeah. And if you look at the black market in Canada, or if you look at the, you know, black market or the legal market in the U S you can see, you know, everyone can see that, you know, a lot of those 2.0 products, you know, obviously starting with vape pens and working down to edibles were, you know, going to be fairly good sellers based on what they were doing in the black market and in the legal market, both in Canada and the U S. No, that's right. You've got, <laughs> again, to my earlier point, uh, you know, we know what the people want, uh, you know, the, the black market's already done the uh, market research for you. Uh, it's just a question of uh, the legal market being able to compete properly uh, with, uh, you know, whether it's consistent quality, consistent uh, packaging, uh, you know, all, all of the things that would pull somebody away from dealing with their uh, legacy supplier uh, or, uh, you know, people who are new to the market want to give it a, want to give it a try. Uh, you know, my own experience in, uh, you know, doing uh, field research, of course, um, is that uh, there are real supply chain issues on the cannabis 2.0 products in Canada and that uh, the uh, individual dispensaries have a, have a very difficult time keeping stock uh, of, of, of popular products. And that more often than not, somebody goes in with an idea that they want to purchase uh, edibles or vapes or whatever, and we'll find that uh, what they had, uh, what they wanted, in fact, is not available, which has been sold out. Which uh, is a little uh, bit ironic given that, you know, overall, if you were to talk to most people about the cannabis sector in Canada, they're talking about how there's this like massive oversupply of product, but it's not, it's an oversupply of flour, which, you know, can right. kind of roll back of, you know, a year or two or three years ago now. You know, most people who had been in the industry kind of recognized that and said that there was going to be this oversupply and there wasn't going to be enough demand. But then on the 2.0 products, it, it, you know, it's taken these companies a lot longer to get up and running to the capacity where they need it. And the demand has been really strong. Yeah, I think yeah and, uh, and, 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 and I'll, I'll, you know, the other thing that <laughs> to, to be blunt that I find irritating right now uh, is the uh, since the government are the only people who are advertising on radio and television now. Uh, if I see that anti-gummy ad one more time, I'm going to throw something at my television. <laughs> I haven't seen it. <laughs> it's maybe an Ontario thing, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, I'm sure it's on YouTube. Oh <laughs> I'll send um, it to you. <laughs> so, you know, where I'd love to end this discussion off, uh, you guys are both so insightful and thank you so much for being a part of this discussion. Why don't we end off the most important part where the money is flowing? What, what financings are we seeing? What kind of alternative financings are out there? Um, you know, and, and finally, I, I think there was a bit of a switch at some point or now to the debt side of things. So, um, you know, Richard, do you want to start off on that one and then, and then we'll go to Bruce? 
Sure, because, uh, you know, really nobody should care what I say. They should, uh, you know, pay attention to Bruce because he's the guy who actually cuts the checks. But, uh, I mean, again, from our perch uh, as the exchange, what we're seeing is exactly what you mentioned, that uh, we, we, we're seeing a high level of, of typical equity finance, although, as Bruce says, in, in some cases, it's the, uh, either a slight or a significant down round. Uh, but the, the leaders, uh, especially in the United States, have been able to raise significant amounts of capital. Um, they're also taking assets off the balance sheet in the sense that, for example, they're selling uh, physical assets, typically uh, greenhouses or indoor grows into uh, REITs that have been established um, for the purpose of uh, investing in uh, cannabis infrastructure. Um, you know, whether that's good or bad in the long term, it's certainly another source of uh, operating capital for these, uh, for these companies. Um, and, uh, you know, we're also going to see a tremendous amount of uh, workout activity. Uh, so there are a lot of assets uh, that uh, will be available at uh, potentially very attractive uh, uh, pricing. And uh, we would expect that uh, both existing uh, public companies and uh, private companies or newly formed entities will be raising capital to uh, secure access to those, uh, uh, to those assets. Uh, and whether that's brands, extraction, retail presence uh, or cultivation capability, I think all of those opportunities are going to be there. So I think it's fair to say that, um, you know, again, this is not, this, this game has, has not even begun to play itself out yet. And, uh, you know, again, people interested in the sector, don't forget that, you know, ultimately, as we know, there is a gigantic business in North America here. Uh, somebody's going to wind up uh, with, with significant shares in the space. And it's really just a question of figuring out, uh, you know, who is going to command that market share in the various segments. Yeah, absolutely. Bruce, what are your thoughts? Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you, you know, just, just to put the math on, on some of the opportunity, right. If, you know, back when, when the Canadian sector was still rolling out, you know, everyone sort of put these, trying to put numbers on the sector. And, you know, I think that the, the number that's kind of been sort of most kind of accurately figured out is, the black market in Canada was somewhere between an eight and ten billion dollar opportunity pre uh, pre legalization, and so you know that's something that will eventually be captured into the legal system over time. And if you think that the U.S. is you know call it roughly you know eight to ten times bigger than the Canadian opportunity, that's huge, huge, huge opportunity. What we're getting most excited about here is you know much like what Richard talked about, and the fact that you know there are um, companies that have gone out and built phenomenal facilities. They have, in some cases, uh, existing brands that are recognized by consumers. And now they're, you know, kind of running low on funds and maybe even management expertise to kind of take them to that next level. And so, you know, we're seeing professional managers, for lack of a better term, come in, much like your, you know, discussion about John Fowler and, you know, the fact that, the majority of the the entrepreneurs who started these cannabis businesses are no longer in place. They've been replaced with, you know, sort of professional managers who are good at execution and operation. And then the second thing is, is from a capital standpoint, in, in most cases, it's only taking a little bit of capital now to move these things to the next level. It's, you know, like I said, with the golf course, it's really the second owner that makes the money on the golf course because the first one blew their brains out making this elaborate place. And then they didn't have enough money to operate. And now we're starting to see where those opportunities come around. And so we're kind of most excited about the fact that we're able to, you know, sort of pick and choose and also, you know, maybe be part of that integration process where this company and that company come together. And now, you know, it's even stronger with a little bit of capital and expertise and that'll really drive, you know, going forward. And at the same time, you're going to see a bunch of companies that shouldn't be there get, you know, sort of left in, in, in the rear view mirror. So that's where we are quite excited about. And then, you know, obviously the, the U.S. and international opportunity, we think, is still huge. So, you know, to Richard's point, you know, in the U.S., you know, there's a huge opportunity there. We find it so ironic that it's an essential service, but still federally illegal. I mean, that in itself, I think, really will change the perception going forward. And, you know, probably doesn't happen before the election. But after that, you probably see some type of move towards, you know, becoming more legal, you know, maybe not a pure legalization, but more legal than it is now. And then the international jurisdictions, I mean, something like Australia, we think there's a tremendous opportunity in a place like that. And then that doesn't even touch on Europe. And, you know, there's, there's 
fantastic opportunity in Europe, both from, you know, the sort of immediate term opportunities, the medical, but we think that ultimately that becomes, you know, recreational opportunity as well. And with everything that's happened with, with, with COVID and we haven't, you know, sort of touched on this too much, I think there's going to be multiple jurisdictions of governments around the world who look at the, just the pure tax revenue side of things as part of the solution to pay for all of this, you know, fiscal really stimulus point. that they need. Right. And, and, and I think that's going to probably accelerate some of the opportunity. That's an incredibly valuable point. Going back to your course, uh, golf course, is it field of green? If you build it, they will come. Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, one more question for you, Bruce. What are you seeing on the debt side? I know that there was kind of a transition in the way companies were having to raise capital, and Richard brought up earlier, you know, that they can't um, they can't file under Section 11 because it's federally illegal as an operation in the U.S. Um, are you still seeing um, a lot of debt being being raised? We have, yeah. I mean, the two things that are that seem to be most prevalent are are, are you know, I guess three debt, the down rounds, the significant down rounds, and um, and then the sale and leasebacks. I mean, those seem to be kind of the the way that they're going to survive. Um, you know, a lot of this, and and probably with new capital coming in from the outside, as as probably being one of the biggest. Yeah, absolutely. And <clears throat> um, sorry, one one final question. I I I, I feel like we could do this forever. Um, do you think, as an investor, because I I feel fairly positive from what you're both saying, um, you know that this still is a great sector. It's still going to see lots of upside. Do you think, uh, just like other sectors, we talk about the fact that you know there's a fire sale on right now? As an investor, any tips from either of you of how you would determine if a company was just needing to be shook out versus a company that actually just has some great discounts and an opportunity to get in. I mean, from, from our perspective, that's not easy. You can't just, you know, look at a stock symbol or even probably read, you know, the press releases and figure that out. It's, it's probably a digger, a deeper dive and digging deeper into, you know, what, where they're at and what they're at and where the trend is and, you know, not just in, in what's happening overall, but what their business looks like as well. And, you know, trying to figure out what's, you know, nonsense and what's actual truth. And that, that in the past has been sort of one of the hardest challenges with the sector, but I think it gets easier now because you have some experience and you're able to take a look at the management teams and say, okay, well, you know, you promised us this back in, you know, two or three years ago and you're, you know, you've, you've accomplished all of that in the time and budget you've said versus other guys who've said, you know, we're going to do that and they haven't accomplished it and they, you know, run over, budget and they don't have any money left and you know they haven't got to where they need so that's a really good takeaway I, I appreciate that one take a look at what they promised and if they executed on it um, you know I think the other thing that's really um, a wonderful opportunity for investors retail investors especially is is people such as yourself Bruce that um, you know have kind of put some of these funds together and and from a retail perspective um, if we can get into pools of funds it's there's a lot more opportunity for um, you know the smaller investor uh, to participate in so appreciate you know kind of everything that you've brought to the table um, I can't well, think and, and even on that front, the, the purchasing power that we bring versus some individual, right? So when these companies are going through restructurings or, you know, down round financings, most individuals don't get access to that now. I mean, they may, but, you know, for the most part, they, they probably don't even see that. Whereas, you know, it's on our radar and we're, you know, certainly in the group of, of, of uh, calls that, you know, happen kind of first, right? That, that's another really important takeaway for people to consider. And, and, you know, whether it's the private placements or if it's kind of getting in on the early stage or seed rounds, um, you know, they just might not know about it until it's had, had a few days in the market. Um, listen, I, I can't thank you guys enough. I actually, I, I got a lot out of this conversation and, and hopefully people that uh, dial in well as well. I, I feel fairly optimistic about the cannabis sector. Um, so it'll be interesting to continue to, watch as it evolves. Um, and also, I can't wait to sit with you both again in person. Um, I will buy the wine. <laughs> That's right. And I'll probably hug both of you too. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, we'll hug. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, thank, yeah, thank you. what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to take a second. I promised uh, Bruce that I would pull up his disclaimer for anyone that's out there listening. Um, 
just one moment, there it is online. Uh, and so if you are watching this, um, this was recorded on Friday, May 1st, 2020. Um, you can pause it now and dive deep into this wonderful disclaimer of Bruce's. Um, and it does have his contact information in there as well. Uh, thank you again so much, uh, gentlemen, for joining me today. I really appreciate it. And um, looking forward to watching um, you know, the sector develop further. Thank you for having me.